Bonjour, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Daniel Bella, and I'm the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. I would like to begin by acknowledging that while we meet today on a virtual platform, McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous people, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. We do this to acknowledge the importance of the land on which we work, study, and live, and to acknowledge the complex web of relationships of which we are a part. Please note that today's lecture is being recorded. Please make sure that your microphones are muted in order to avoid any interruptions. If you have any questions, you can use the chat box. Uh, so write your questions during the talk or immediately uh, afterwards. There will be a Q&A uh, period following uh, the talk. And uh, we, uh, you are welcome to submit uh, questions at any time uh, using the chat box. Fondé en 1994, grâce à euh, un accord entre la famille Bronfman et l'Université McGill, l'Institut d'études canadiennes de McGill a pour but de promouvoir une meilleure compréhension du Canada. L'Institut s'efforce de faire avancer la société canadienne, principalement en organisant des conversations sur des sujets qui sont importants pour les Canadiens et les Canadiennes, en formant des étudiants et en euh, les motivant à façonner le Canada de demain et finalement, en favorisant la recherche interdisciplinaire sur le pays. It is our pleasure today to host Graham Fraser, formerly Canada's longest serving commissioner of official languages, uh, who has been involved in many important issues concerning the language rights of Canadians. Graham Fraser uh, is currently a senior fellow at the University of Ottawa and a member of the board of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. His new book, the Fate of Canada, F.R. Scott's Journal of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, 1963-1971, introduces readers to Scott's biography, puts his diary entries into the political context of the time, and identifies the people who he met and the places he visited during the hearings of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. Never before published, these diaries provide remarkable insight into the inner life of one of 20th century's, uh, 20th century's most significant intellectuals here in Canada, and a royal commission that shaped the nation's language policy for decades to come. The Fate of Canada is published by McGill Queen's University Press. And I'm happy to tell you today that uh, we have um, a series uh, uh, the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada is in the process of creating a series uh, with McGill Queen's University Press. And our guest today, Graham Fraser, is also on the editorial board of that series. And the first two books in the series should appear later this year. So stay tuned about that. As for the fate of Canada, it is available from our friends at Paragraph Bookstore. And there will be a link in the chat to purchase it online. I will now uh, turn to, to Graham. C'est maintenant à, à ton tour, Graham, euh, de nous parler de ce nouveau livre euh, qui est consacré euh, à F.R. Euh, Scott, à sa vie et à son implication dans euh, la, la Commission euh, royale euh, sur le bilinguisme et le, multi, euh, et le, 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 le biculturalisme. Hein, le bilinguisme et le biculturalisme. Donc, euh, Graham, on est toujours très content euh, de pouvoir t'entendre. Et euh, merci encore. Et donc, c'est à toi. Merci beaucoup, Daniel. Et juste euh, avant de commencer, euh, s'il y a des questions euh, en français, je serais euh, ravi euh, euh, d'y répondre euh, en français plus tard. Mais mes commentaires, tout comme le livre d'ailleurs, euh, seront euh, euh, en anglais. Um, I'd like to start by by thanking Philip Cherconi of McGill Queen's University Press and all of the staff, uh, particularly Mark Abley and and uh, Susan Glickman, who, who did a marvelous job in protecting me from myself and the early drafts of the of the manuscript. I'd also like to thank Cecil Rabinovich, who invited me to give the FR Scott lecture um, 
organized by uh, uh, Friends of the Library at McGill, which was uh, my introduction to, uh, to, to this and provided my, if you like, my rough draft of the, uh, what became the introduction and the conclusion. Um, Marco de Guzman, a student at the University of Ottawa, transcribed the second part uh, of uh, the, the, the diary. Uh, and Don Winkler, who interviewed me for his film on F.R. Scott, really sparked the beginning of this this journey of my discovery of uh, of Frank Scott. Before I talk about the journal, let me say a few things about Frank Scott. Um, he was um, a lawyer, a law professor, a poet, uh, a socialist, um, a political activist, and a translator. Uh, he won the Governor General's Literary Award both for poetry and also for nonfiction, his essays on the Constitution. He was a Rhodes Scholar, and it was at Oxford that he met Lester Pearson, who ultimately named him to the Royal Commission. He was active in the creation of the CCF and the NDP. He was a civil libertarian and fought Quebec Premier Maurice Duplessis both on uh, the padlock law uh, and also um, on uh, fighting for the uh, the rights to publish um, um, Lady Chatterley's Lover. Um, he was a mentor to um, Pierre Trudeau and uh, also a confidant of Michael Pitfield, who became Pierre Trudeau's uh, uh, clerk of the Privy Council. He was married to Marion Dale Scott, a, uh, a painter, but had numerous affairs. Um, he, as a result of a, a youthful misadventure, uh, he had only one eye um, and he had a wicked sense of humor. I have an odd personal connection um, with Frank Scott. My parents jointly with the Scotts purchased a cottage in, in North Hatley um, and uh, it was a cottage that I now own. Um, coincidentally, the the cover of of the book uh, is taken from a slide that I found at the bottom of a plastic TWA flight bag at the bottom of a uh, cupboard at the back of the cottage, a sort of shed-like corridor at the back of the cottage. Um, and uh, my my only uh, sense of misgiving about using it is that. Uh, uh, it is, I assume it was taken by Marion and it has a sense of warmth and intimacy, which um, uh, the diary does not necessarily uh, reflect. Um, because we were at the cottage when they weren't and vice versa, I didn't often see him, but whenever I did, it was memorable. Scott had been arguing for some 25 years um, that Canada was a bilingual country. Uh, uh, when Lester Pearson named him to the Royal Commission. So uh, he was a, a natural appointee. He was the only English speaking Quebecer on the Royal Commission. And um, he notes in the journal at the very beginning that he was on a first name basis with all of the other Quebec members and he didn't know any of the members from the rest of the country. The commission's co-chairs were Davidson Dunton and Andre Londo. Um, but the real debate for the first five years of the commission was between Le Rondeau and Scott. Le Rondeau did not really understand Scott, and he, uh, he asked his friend Leon Dion, who was the di director of research uh, on the commission, to write him a paper uh, explaining Scott's vision as compared to his own and uh, the tensions between them. Dion, wrongly in my view, concluded that Scott's vision was individualistic and optimistic, while Le Rondeau's was collective and pessimistic. This ignored Scott's work for the CCF and his view expressed in 1949 that the Canadian constitution had more definite protection for groups, minorities, than for individuals. The guarantee for the loose use of the two languages, for instance, and for denominational schools are group freedoms, Scott wrote. Laurent Dion concluded, was not far from believing that the Quebec government was the only guarantor of French culture in Canada. 
This contrast in views quite clearly comes from the fact that Mr. Scott, from his individualist point of view, ignores groups, he wrote. Valérie Lapointe-Gagnon, who the, you know, at the University of Alberta, who found this comment, this paper by, uh, by Léon Zion, argues in her book, Passé le Canada, that Scott did not believe in biculturalism in the sense that he did not believe in the existence of two nations within Canada. In fact, Scott did, or at least he believed that French Canada was a nation. He just didn't think it was limited to Quebec. And in fact, so in, sometimes in the same paragraph, you'll see a flip back and forth between his reference to French Canada as a nation and Quebec as a nation. The line of thought I have hitherto developed does not deny the existence of French Canada as a nation, Scott wrote, adding, I do not believe that the rest of Canada, apart from Quebec, can properly be called a nation, since it's composed of heterogeneous groups, united only by the use of a common language and the desire to be politically united in a single state, which includes Quebec. If Quebec is separated from them, they do not even live in a contiguous area. So I reject the two nation theory without denying that Quebec can properly be called a nation. The commissioners first met in 1963 and worked together until 1971. The diary, which covers the eight years of the Royal Commission's existence, covers three separate phases, or what I've identified as three separate phases of the Royal Commission. The first is the early public hearings, which revealed the huge gap in public understanding and opinion between French-speaking and English-speaking Canadians, and led to the preliminary report and the famous line that, without fully realizing it, Canada was passing through the greatest crisis in its history. In June 1964, after a stormy meeting in Quebec City, the commissioners agreed there was a crisis and they had to produce a preliminary report saying so. In a note for the commission in July 1964, Scott spelled out what the crisis was. More than differences of opinion, not the possibility of violence or a deadlock or breakdown in government. In saying there's a crisis and a very serious crisis in Canada, we mean that in our opinion, there has occurred a permanent shift of opinion in Quebec towards confederation, resulting in a demand for changes in the basic constitution of a radical kind. Scott goes on to identify some of the factors at play. The debate in Quebec over education, which was actually a debate over secularism, and the question of whether Quebec was the sole bastion of French culture in North America, or whether the whole of Canada was the proper area for the development of that culture. He concluded, the greatest crisis as we see it is thus a complex one containing many factors, but the fundamental issue is the relationship between the two nations or the two parts of the single nation. In other terms, the relationship between the two culture and linguistic groups whose study is the purpose of this commission. These are in a critical state and the choices now forced upon us are critical for the future of Canada. That was in the first phase. There was a second phase as the commissioners worked away to produce their reports and hammered out their recommendations. And then a final period in which the commissioners reached a deadlock over whether or not to make recommendations for constitutional change over Scott's objections. A preview two decades earlier of the conflict and final failure of the Meech Lake Accord. At the beginning, Scott was full of enthusiasm. He was a year from retirement as Dean of Law at McGill and his deanship had not been a particularly happy one. He was enthusiastic about his fellow commissioners and enjoyed not only the formal sessions, but also the social encounters that followed. So much so that I suggested calling the book Martinis and Pernod. Um, this was not accepted by the publisher for understandable reasons, but it, I, I retain this as a, an insight into the uh, vivid social relationships that developed. He disagreed with Le Rondeau, vented some of that disagreement at some of the meetings, at one point expressing his frustration and pouring out 11 myths about the two societies 
that he felt that Landau had ignored. Let me quote from one passage from November 1964 that expresses those differences. Just for the record, here is my list of myths omitted by Lohondo. I state them briefly. One, the French were first in Canada everywhere. Because they've settled on the banks of the St. Lawrence, they're supposed to have some priority in British Columbia. They know practically nothing of the English exploration and first settlement of other parts of North America. Two, the English rights in Quebec come from the French and are evidence of its greater generosity in the treatment of minorities. Actually, English rights in Quebec come from the English, from the time when they controlled the entire province. This is not the whole truth, since there have been further grants of separate school rights since 1867, but the basic pattern was set before that date. Three, the French are settlers in Canada, but the English are invaders. Interesting how the, the term settlers has acquired a, a whole different meaning since then. Four, the French are a minority everywhere, but the English are invaders. Sorry, the French are settlers in their Canada, but the English are invaders. Four, the French are a minority everywhere. This leads them to think that their position is precarious and therefore they must become independent. Actually, the French majority in Quebec wields an almost undisputed sovereignty over the vast area of provincial jurisdiction. A corollary of this minority myth is that being a minority, they're perpetually dominated by the majority and do not control its decisions on any important matter. Five, the French are willing to learn English, but the English won't learn French. Actually, the British element in Quebec is more bilingual than the French. Both races are the same in this regard. Neither learns the other language unless it has to. Minorities always have to learn a little more than the majorities all over the world. Six, Lord Durham was an evil monster. Suggestions of this are found even in La Rondeau's drafting of chapter five. To the French, Durham was a great assimilator. To the English, he's a great decolonizer. And this, that line was actually used in, in the Royal Commission's report. Quebec pays no attention to responsible government. I picked up also the word La Rondeau put in, priest-ridden, and showed that while it is an insulting term, from the point of view of Protestant Canada, the fact that Quebec has not a single lay school, college or university for the French speaking people, the fact that the place names are predominantly attached to Catholic saints, and the fact that in the Catholic parishes, the parish authorities can use the civil courts to enforce payment of church dues is understandably going to make the Anglo-Saxon people feel that the influence of the priest and the social life of the province is excessive. I might've mentioned the crucifixes in the courtrooms, but didn't. Seven, the constitutional rights of the French Canadian have been widely violated in Canada. There's confusion here between constitutional and moral rights, which Laurent makes briefly. Eight, the French Canadian is a second class citizen. He means by this that he rarely occupies the top positions in the economic activities of the province, but he is supremely top in the religious activities of the province, still the most important, and in almost all of the professions, except those requiring high technical training. He also commands an ever-increasing area of small industry and commerce, as well as the provincial political field. Thus, it is more true to say that only in the economic area do the English have a privileged place. In these other activities, as well as in politics, it is a handicap to belong to the English minority. Nine, there is nothing in common between the two cultures. 10, the English always assimilate minorities everywhere. 11, the corruption of the French spoken in Quebec is due to the proximity of the English. Actually, Joal was first found in the Chicouni area where there are very few English. An NFB film about a small fishing village in Quebec, absolutely remote from the English, beautifully made, was shown in France recently and had to have French subtitles added or otherwise the speech of the characters would never have been understood. So you can see some of the passionate engagement that, that Scott made to the, the, the discussions uh, and how he used his diary to, to jot down those, those things that he said. Although he quite clearly said that this was received in very good spirit and uh, did not cause any, any hard feelings. And Laurent was a conciliator and they did achieve consensus. Nonetheless, if you read the first volume of the Royal Commission's report carefully, you can see Scott's and Laurent's views kind of intertwined, one emerging at one point and the other at another. 
another turning point came with La Rondeau's death in 1968. Scott wrote a moving tribute in Le Devoir in which he mentioned La Rondeau's deep belief in French culture and in French Canada. It would perhaps be fairer to say that his faith in human values was even deeper, but he knew that those values had to be expressed in a language and a culture. And for him, it was the French language and culture. Scott praised him for his fairness and his ability to listen to the arguments of those with whom he was in violent disagreement, something which Scott himself found extremely difficult. I also admire André Landau for his hatred of dictatorship and fascism, Scott wrote. He's among the few public men who dared take a position on the Spanish Civil War and show their sympathy for the Republican government. Any sign of autocracy in the Quebec government led immediately to a reaction of opposition. He was a friend of liberty and equal justice for all. Landau also kept a journal during his years in the Royal Commission, but it was much more personal than Scott, uh, Scott's. When I mentioned this separately to two Quebec historians, uh, they both used the same word to describe Lorando, uh, There was, Scott was not tortured and the journal is much more a lawyer's notes on the commission's uh, hearings and meetings um, and much less about his soul. This is not about Scott's soul. However, like a note in a bottle thrown into the sea and found 50 years later, it is revealing both of Scott and of the time he was living in. Although a socialist, he was comfortable with the Canadian elite, deputy ministers, Supreme Court justices, and Tory senators. And he recounts his lunches or dinners with, with many of them. And while committed to liberty and equal justice for all, he could be a snob. His vision of the country was deeply bicultural, and he was condescending about the commissioners who were pushing for a multicultural view of Canada. And his thinking about indigenous peoples was dismissive. In 1965, in an essay for the commission called A View of Canada, he wrote, a half continent, much of it bleak and inhospitable, which possessed few original inhabitants and those but little advanced in the civil, civilized arts, has been subdued for human habitation and developed into an ordered system of society, particularly in the period since 1867. No one could write or say that today without being vigorously attacked. Lohondo's death marked a significant change in the commission. The first volume had been published and the Liberal government began implementing some of the recommendations the introduction in Parliament of the Official Languages Act and the creation of the role of the Commissioner of Official Languages. Paul Lacoste, who had joined the Commission in 1965, he was originally on, on the Commission staff, when Jean Marchand resigned to enter politics, was a much more rigid nationalist than Lorando had been and pushed for recommendations for significant transfer of powers to Quebec. Scott began to dig in his heels in opposition and began to be increasingly concerned about the trend towards unilingualism in Quebec. As a result, Scott felt increasingly isolated and concerned about the future of the English minority. He did concede, succeed with Jean-Louis Gagnon in fending off the pressure to have the commission make recommendations on the constitution. But at the end of the commission's work, he wrote a note entitled, the end of the affair, which captured the sense of gloom he felt. I will close on a personal note, he wrote. It is astonishing and also frightening for me to watch Quebec abandon so many of its ancient virtues and values in order to rush into the North American capitalist system with arms open for the embrace. The values of that system I learned to despise and respect in the 1930s. I had hoped that the Catholic tradition with its greater emphasis on social obligations would somehow mitigate the prevailing Protestant ethic of free enterprise. Now I'm not so sure this can happen, though we did find by our research that in their attitudes towards business, the Francophones tend to think more than Anglophones of their duty to society and less of mere profit making. However, these values were mostly from the not too successful. 
the giant corporations in our economy are anti-cultural forces. Witness their pollution of the air through commercial advertisements on radio and TV. This does us far more damage than exhaust fumes from automobiles. Making them speak more French won't change their ethics. If Quebec is to pull herself out of the psychological trauma in which she now struggles, it will only be by strict leadership of dedicated people firmly believing in the immense value of the French language and culture and working from where they now are steadily toward a more socially purposeful utilization of economic resources for human betterment. This Quebec cannot do alone. She must have federal help and she must cooperate willingly and imaginatively with the federal government. There never has been a federal government in the history of Canada so willing to accept this cooperation. This is the opportunity that must not be missed. It may not come again. And so you sense his deep commitment to, to the federal government. He was a belief that the predominant federal power had been undermined by uh, the Privy Council in, uh, in the earlier years before uh, that power was taken away. And that sense of despair or sense of, of gloom um, marked a fair amount of his feeling. In 1970, the commission began gradually to come to an end. To borrow from T.S. Eliot, it began with a bang and is ending with a whimper, Scott quipped. But I think you will agree that because of its work, Canada will never be quite the same again. In the 14 years, from the end of the commission to his death in 1985, his sadness changed to anger and bitterness. The Liberals, Bill 22, the BQs, Bill 101, the notwithstanding clause and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, all infuriated and frustrated. Nolando had wanted Quebec's fragile language situation to be protected, and it was. Scott believed that Quebec's tradition of cultural, constitutional, and uh, social bilingualism and biculturalism should be extended to the rest of the country. And except for federal institutions, it wasn't really. He had a sense of having failed. But it's possible now, 50 years after the end of the Royal Commission and three and a half decades after Scott's death, to see the magnitude of his achievements. His influence on Pierre Trudeau was huge. His contribution to the Royal Commission was enormous. His thinking was an inspiration to the debates that led to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. His clarity of thought defining language rights as human rights laid the groundwork for the edifice of jurisprudence on language. And his insistence on the rule of law presaged the critical role the courts have played in defining language rights. The groundbreaking Supreme Court decision on the secession of Quebec with its definition of minority rights as one of the central elements of Canadian doc democracy stands on the foundation he helped build. Frank Scott laid out clearly before the courts established the principle in law and jurisprudence that language rights are human rights. And as he so eloquently put it, if human rights and harmonious relations between cultures are forms of the beautiful, then the state is a work of art that is never finished. Thank you.